All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back to the channel. I'm very excited about my guest today. She is going to tell you a little bit about her story, how she has recovered from PCOS, a lot of other issues, and now she's gone on to really help and encourage other people as well. So without further ado, would you go ahead and just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your story? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Danny Hamilton, and my Instagram handle is Danielle Hamilton Health, and I am a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. It's a long lot of words to say that I'm essentially a holistic nutritionist, and I help people find their optimal diet and lifestyle and use a whole variety of approaches to find really deep healing. And one of, so my story begins, I guess, back, I'll try to make it quickly, <laughs> quick, because, you know, we all have these really long stories, but my story kind of begins where everyone else's does like in childhood, you know, I ate the standard American diet. I had lots and lots and lots of processed carbs, pretty much only processed carbs. So that would be like, you know, cereal and breakfast food. If it was breakfast food that had my name on it. And I liked the sweet carbs, not just like the starchy carbs. And so I had a sugar tooth, every tooth in my mouth was sweet. And, um, and I just always ate these foods and never really thought anything of it. Um, my mom was always trying to make sure that I didn't gain weight because she didn't want me to be bullied. And she was always working out herself. So she was a proponent at that time of like, like the low fat diet was kind of out in the late eighties, early nineties. And so, you know, she would kind of, I realized the other day, like I hardly ever had any red meat when I was growing up because my mom didn't have that because, you know, red meat had too much fat in it and all that, you know, uh, dogma of the, the nineties. So I started, you know, I was pretty sickly as a kid. I would get a lot of ear infections. I had eczema when I was a kid. I had, I like um, the same person. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. Same, same. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Keep going. You no, know, that's okay. Um, and then I, I had so many rounds of antibiotics. I would get strep throat all the time. Then I was getting into high school and I was getting strep throat. Like I got it six times in a year, got my tonsils out. Then the very next year I went to college. And so that meant a lot more drinking and eating worse food. And, and then I got really, really bad allergies. So I never really connected the tonsils to the allergies, but that's part of your immune system. It like flags invaders. So it was pretty crazy. And I guess not so coincidental that I happened to develop these allergies. And I always said at the time, like, oh, my grandma got allergies when she was older. It's genetic. And I just believed that. And so I then I moved to Miami from New York. And I, it was instead of like seasonal allergies, the season was all year round. So I was so sick all the time and so allergic. I was on multiple prescriptions. I had multiple inhalers because I didn't only have the allergies. I also got asthma and I had chronic sinus infections that wouldn't go away. I was on, I, I mean, I was living at the CVS pharmacy. <laughs> like I was like sponsored by CVS pharmacy because I was always there having all these prescriptions. And I was in my early twenties and I was getting allergy shots and I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but oh, it, yeah. yeah. So like you get tested for the allergies, depending on how many things you're allergic to, you get a certain number of shots. Well, some people would just have one shot because they were allergic to like 10 things, whatever. I had three shots to start out with, which meant I was allergic to a lot. Then a year later, I started having allergies again and I was developing more allergies to more things. And so I had five shots. And at the time I worked in a nursing home as a speech pathologist. And I asked them, can I please take these shots to the nursing facility that I work at and have a nurse there give it to me because I was going in debt from all the co-pays. Oh. And so, so, and yeah, and, and I was still eating standard American diet at this time. So I, the, the nurse at the nursing home taught me how to give myself the shots. And so I gave myself five allergy shots in the stomach every other day. I mean, oh. this is what I was doing in my early twenties. And I always say that I was like one bite of bread away from an autoimmune disease because I bet my gut was just horrible. So. Oh. I was at work one time and I heard something about the paleo diet and I was like, what does that mean? And I read Rob Wolf's book, The Paleo Solution. And all of a sudden this whole talk about real food and 
all this unlearning of all this traditional wisdom that we had been taught and that I just kind of knew by default from commercials and who knows what, it was just like, erase everything, do a 180 on everything. And that's your new information. And it just made so much sense. Like everything I was reading in the book about how all these disorders and diseases and pharmaceuticals I was seeing in the patients at the nursing home because they had a list of diagnoses that were this big and their, their prescription list was twice the size. And I'm like, this is my future if I don't change. And so I did like a whole 30 and I felt so much better. And I was with (laughs) one of my partners, at the time um, threw a piece of bread at me and told me I was in a cult because I wouldn't eat bread anymore. I had a lot of pushback from people around me, um, but I stuck with it and I just became, I like threw myself in. I loved paleo because all of a sudden I started eating real food. I got rid of mostly dairy and gluten, I think were the two that were giving me the most issues, but um, my allergies went away and it was effortless. Like I never had I've never had another allergy pill or anything since then. I didn't have to refill my prescriptions and it was just amazing. So, so many things went away and I was doing great on paleo. And then uh, I had a really stressful time. I broke up with that person who threw the bread at me <laughs> and, um, oh. <laughs> yeah. and I had a really stressful year. I, I moved back to New York. I wasn't happy there. And I had, so it was a lot of stress, a a lot of adrenal fatigue, hormone stuff. And then all of a sudden I stopped getting my period. I was gaining all this weight and I was like, what's going on? And all of a sudden I started to get acne again. I'm like, I had acne, you know, it was really bad, made really bad by the pill. So I got off that like back in the day, but I'm like, I thought I was getting better. What's happening. And I, I loved paleo so much. I felt so much better from it. So I just was like, I need to paleo harder. So I just tried to do, you know, more of the same. And I just wasn't getting anywhere and I wasn't seeing any results. And I'm like, why is this diet of real natural foods? Why is it making me so overweight? Like Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. And my mom was like, it's because of the fat. (laughs) And I'm like, I know it's not like, I know in my heart, it's not because of that. I felt that it wasn't what it probably was, was the combination of the fat and the carbs together um, because I was doing a lot of paleo carbs at the time. So I ended up getting diagnosed with PCOS. I went to this gynecologist. He told me there's no cure for PCOS and you have to take the pill. And I was like, okay, buddy, like, (laughs) like, no, bye. Uh, And I left and I, I was like, I'm going to reverse my PCOS without him. And so I did. And it took a while because I was trying to, I was just trying to, you know, I know that PCOS, for those of you who don't know, it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. And there's, to diagnose it, it's really just a collection of symptoms. So you might have missing or absent periods or late periods. You might have acne like I had or weight gain. And some other symptoms that I didn't have were like thinning hair and hair on the face. Those are some other symptoms or you could have like darkening of the skin. And they say that a lot of women with PCOS have insulin resistance. Well, it's actually the other way around, which I didn't know at the time. So I was trying to work on all these sex hormones because when you have PCOS, you have elevated androgens, which mean testosterone, like the male sex hormones, testosterone and DHEA. And so I was trying to do everything to like raise my progesterone and, and balance my estrogen. And, and I just wasn't getting, making any headway at all. And it was really frustrating. And so I decided to go on some pharmaceuticals. I went on metformin. I went on spironolactone for the acne. And those things really helped me. But if, if you know anything about those drugs, they're drugs for people generally with diabetes. And so it's, I didn't know it at the time, but there was this blood sugar component that I just, I had no idea. So I, um, I finally found 
keto and fasting. I started listening to um, Dr. Jason Fung and on his podcast, Megan Ramos said di- uh, PCOS is the diabetes of the ovaries. And I just about like ran my car off the road because I was like, oh my goodness, what do you mean? Diabetes, blood sugar? Like I never knew I had anything wrong with my blood sugar. And so I started looking into it and I realized that I would go get fast blood sugar, my blood sugar would be 60. I mean, I was like about to pass out. I was shaky. I could not fast. I was the, I was that person who had to eat before I went out to eat because just in case it took too long, I was that person who had snacks in my bag with me because I just always needed to eat. And I never thought about it, but those are all signs of dysregulated blood sugar. And so I learned that PC, POS in over 80% of women who have it, it's really just a manifestation of insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest aha moment and eye-opening moment I ever had. And so I started incorporating keto and fasting. I played around with, you know, a little bit of carnivore. I didn't do so, my body just didn't feel that great on carnivore. So I, um, I lean heavily towards animal-based keto and that feels really good. And then I've since evolved my diet from there, but I just, I finally was able to reverse PCOS. I have no symptoms of it anymore. And yeah, that's my story. (laughs) That's awesome. I love it. And how long did you have to kind of stick with, um, keto and living that lifestyle before you started seeing a shift and a change? What did that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. So I went keto in February of 2018 And I remember like messaging like Sean Minor, Keto keto for Women. I like looked at her, I listened to her podcast all the time and there weren't as many keto people out there in 2018. That was kind of when it was all starting. And so when I, I was just like waiting and waiting for my period to get better, I had a lot of PMS symptoms and I had, you know, breast tenderness and and like moodiness and bloating and all those things before my cycle breakouts, like you name the PMS symptom, I probably had it. And I was just just like, when is this going to get better? And within like four to five months, I started finally seeing a change in my cycle. Um, At the time, my cycle was regular. uh, um, So I did have a, a regular cycle before that. Some women with PCOS start keto and they don't even have a cycle. But I will say that it took a while to kind of make an impact on those sex hormones. And that's traditionally what we see because there's like this hormonal hierarchy and we can't, it, it can't be as simple as just a pyramid, but sometimes that's helpful to simplify it so we can kind of get an understanding. But first, all hormones affect each other. But we have on this on the bottom of that pyramid, like oxytocin is super important. It's like the antidote to cortisol and our circadian rhythm. That's like super foundational. That's going to affect all our hormones. And then right above that, we have insulin and cortisol. And insulin is going to affect everything above it. And so above that would be our thyroid and then our sex hormones on the top. So I wasn't making an impact by trying to target these sex hormones because I needed to target the bottom layers and then things kind of fell into place. So it's not a perfect model, but it's, for me, it was really helpful to kind of think about it like that. And so I did start to see improvement, like you said, in like um, four to five months. And then to really reverse all my symptoms uh, and start losing weight. I mean, it happened pretty, pretty quickly for me um, within that that amount of time, like six months, but I'm someone who just holds on to a little bit of body fat. My weight fluctuates sometimes depending. uh, My weight is really influenced by my stress levels. Mm -hmm. I notice that my, if I am like really stressed out, I will hold on to belly fat. I'll hold on to, it feels like bloat. It just feels like a layer of inflammation weight. And there's nothing I could do about it except for come (laughs) <laughs> calm down, right? And work on the de-stress. Yeah, it's I'm just kind of going down that rabbit hole myself because and I think a lot of people are with the pandemic. It's like, you know, I feel like I put 20 pounds on overnight, literally, because I was so stressed out. I was so stressed out. Just this whole, you know, is so unpredictable. Mm-hmm. And I've been working a little bit with Judy, who's also an NTP, and found out that my 
sodium potassium levels were like through the roof. Oh, right from over supplementing? Um, from over supplementing and stress from my adrenals. Yes. It's producing too much because I'm a fast metabolizer. And so when you're a fast metabolizer, you're going to overproduce, you know, and you're going to try to overcompensate and that will cause your body to swell and hang on to a ton of extra water weight. And I never understood that before. And I'm like, stress was the catalyst here that yes. started to cause this issue. And then over supplementing certainly did not help because I thought, well, I'm swollen because I'm lacking, but it was the opposite, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That was something that, um, and of course, insulin plays a role yes. with the, with bloating and everything like that. And one of the craziest things that went away on my body was that, that cyclical bloating that I used to get with my cycle. So yeah. as soon as I got off of, you know, um, off of those higher amounts of carbs, I never had that bloating again. I was like, oh, I just thought this is how my body was, but it, it wasn't. So that's amazing. But that's really important because the cortisol is going to impact the blood sugar nice. and insulin. And so it's going to play into that cycle again. And so no matter how good your blood sugar is from your diet, if you're having stress, it's going to just hijack the whole system. Yeah. I always tell the story of the first week of the pandemic, I was wearing a CGM because I had decided to do an experiment that week. And I was mm -hmm. eating like super high fat, you know, trying to do everything perfect, you know, to keep this blood sugar at us. And it was that first week completely crazy. Cause we had a bunch of other stuff happen here at the house. Our basement flooded. Someone hacked into my bank account, took all my money. It was like, just like crazy time. And then like, well, there's no school and everyone's not working anymore. Bye. Uh, <laughs> my, that CGM showed my numbers were like 110, 120, 130. And I was eating like um, a 90% fat, 10% protein. I was like, super therapeutic ketosis. And my body was like, Nope. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> we need a lot of sugar. Cause you have a lot of stress. Yeah. It, it'll yeah. make it. So yeah. I think that we overemphasize the diet. Like it's important. Like this, another reason I want to talk to you is like, you have this story where you did this diet and it's helped you immensely. Um, but like you were saying, we have to take that stress into accountability as well, because it can wreak so much havoc on the body. Yeah. So I find with a lot of my clients, they'll, or a lot of people who message me on Instagram, they're like, I'm eating a carnivore diet and I'm eating like super low carb and I, I can't get my blood sugar down. And so I'm like, okay, so what, what do you do every day to relax? Like, what are you doing for your movement? Are you building muscle? How is your sleep? Like there's, you know, are there toxins? Are there stressors? Um, you know, are you over fasting and stressing your body out? You yeah. know, like we need to talk about all those other things and they all are going to impact our blood sugar. Yeah. So a lot of times people are just trying so hard to find that perfect diet that they're just missing the forest for the trees. And so I'm having a, uh, I'm working on a membership program right now that's going to launch in January and it's going to be called beyond the macros mm -hmm. and health is more than just carbs, fats, and protein. And it's going to be about like making this holistic, healthy lifestyle to support what we're already doing with our food. So most of us some of us are new and they're like, okay, what food can I eat? It's the perfect place to start. So if that's where you're at, like keep working on the food, but also start to notice like what else is going on around me? Like, what does my day look like? Do, did I meditate today? Did I go for a walk? Did I move my body? Like what, what am I doing to support my sleep? You know, like one of my favorite things to do is I have an alarm on my phone. It goes off at eight. That's when I turn off all my screens. I have it even like on the iPhone, you can yeah. have it like turn off all your apps, except for like texting and calls. And so the apps turn off and then I put on, I have it like a red light bulb in my bedroom. I use the Himalayan salt lamp. Like I'm lowering the lights. Like there's a lot of just lifestyle tweaks that you can do that can really really help to bring down these stress levels, which we know are impacting our blood sugar and can help us, our body just get this restorative, like 
rest that it needs. And uh, like tapping into that parasympathetic, we're supposed to be in that parasympathetic mode, like something like 80% of the time so we can heal, so we can balance our blood sugar and our hormones, so we can detoxify, so we can repair, so we can digest, but we're not. We are in fight or flight nonstop. I, well, I am. <laughs> so like I'm, and like throughout this pandemic, I've been working so hard to try to get all these lifestyle pieces into, you know, it's not enough to just do it one time, you know? Yeah. So it's like, what, how can we make these new habits? How can we, you know, should we start with one thing, making it a morning and an evening routine? There's so many things we can do to play around with and try to just like really, that really move that needle towards more optimal health that are, that, and that's why we say like holistic, this is the, yes. the whole part of it. You know, we're not just beings that eat. <laughs> so we need to look yeah. at all those different things. I, you're like preaching to the choir here because I see the same thing. I mean, I get messages from people constantly on Instagram and YouTube that they're like, I'm just doing this. I feel like I'm doing it perfectly. I'm not cheating. And I'm still, I still can't sleep. I still have like all this stuff. And it's like, if you're not treating your lifestyle as a whole, you know, and you're freaking out about everything, you're not worried about your sleep, you're keeping your screen, you're laying in bed every night, scrolling till God knows what time, you're absolutely undoing all the good that your diet has the potential to do. You're not giving yourself that best chance. Um, yeah. But yeah. Exactly. And I see your aura ring and I have oh, yeah. that as well. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, and like this thing doesn't lie, <laughs> you no. know? So when you, like when I see on the days, you know, before the election, oh my, my heart God. rate variability was garbage yeah. and that's a measure of stress in your body. So mine was garbage. I woke yeah. up a bunch of times in the night and last night I didn't have any wake ups in the night. <laughs> and I was like, finally, <laughs> finally. So yeah. So yeah, yeah, mine's been a wreck too. I'm mm -hmm. like, this last week has been so super stressful yeah. and yeah, it's like those wake ups and then not hitting your deep and REM cycles the way that you know that you could, um, you know, like you're something's up, you're stressed out and exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So talk to me a little bit about like, I know you did keto for a while and tried carnivore a little bit. What does your diet look like now? Um, to keep your blood sugar stable, because I know a lot of your, your platform is, you know, the blood sugar coach and helping people stabilize their blood sugar. So what does that look like for you now after healing PCOS? Yeah. So I actually haven't come out on my channel and spoken about how I'm not personally doing keto consistently anymore. And I'm going to, but I think I'm going to do it on like a podcast episode <laughs> and, yeah. you know, because a lot of people go crazy when you kind of, it's like this one thing worked for you and you identify with it. And like, like I look at a diet as a therapeutic healing protocol mm -hmm. and that protocol is going to be customized to me because I'm the one eating it and it's going to keep changing over time. So right now, what my, what my goals are, are to keep my blood sugar, you know, somewhat balanced, not necessarily how keto is like, you know, always like under a hundred, but little hills and being able to kind of maintain metabolic flexibility. So I haven't been doing like strict keto or fasting for a while and I can wake up and I'm in ketosis. And that is to me, that's amazing. And so I've been kind of back to paleo a little bit, and so I've been adding a few um, fruits. I found out that I wasn't sensitive to dairy anymore, which is like the best thing ever because dairy is like my favorite food group. Um, so I've been having whole milk yogurt. I'll put some like wild frozen blueberries on there because they're not as sweet. And so I'm still minding my carbs. I don't measure as much. I don't check my glucose as much but I feel the same energy levels. I know that for me, if I were to have, let's say like an apple with nut butter, I know that that would be way too many carbs um, and I won't feel well. So I'll kind of use all the different hacks, like adding 
um, the carbs at the end of the meal, for example. And so it doesn't have as much of an impact on my blood sugar. So uh, I might have, I'm also trying to increase my like vitamin C content. I'm looking a little bit at some of those like pro metabolic people trying to like take some things out of there, um, which they're into like the root cause protocol. So it's a lot of like vitamin C and stuff. And I think I have too much iron because my dad has hemochromatosis. I feel like I might have it, but that's just an aside, but I am trying to, so like I'll have some clementines since they're in season, I'll have a clementine for the vitamin C and then I'll go for a walk right after that. So I'm going to be using all that glucose and I don't have a crash afterwards. I feel fine. I've been eating a little bit more frequently than normal, but um, and the other thing I've been doing is I've actually decreased my vegetable intake. Um, I found that vegetables in general have been making my, like, they just, I don't digest them very well, no matter what. So um, I've been kind of doing more, a lot of meat, a lot of fat, and, you know, a little bit of like some fruits, a few like beets and more like root vegetables, carrots and things like that. And I don't know, just kind of really focusing. I'm, and I'm focusing a lot on um, like those really, those carnivore type superfoods. So I'm doing lots of liver. I have salmon roe and I'm just trying to increase my nutrient density. I got raw milk and I'm just playing around with more of like that ancestral kind of template and just forcing myself to have things that I don't like, even though just because they're good for me. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing now. And uh, once in a while, depending on where I am in my cycle, usually like the first half of the cycle, I might play with an intermittent fasting day. I might do a strict keto day. Um, and then towards the second half of my cycle, that's when I bring the carbs in a little bit more because that can be helpful for building progesterone. I haven't noticed any changes in my skin. So no acne. I haven't noticed any changes in my cycle. I haven't had PMS. So I've been able to add in a little bit more carbohydrate and I'm not going crazy with carbs, but I'm adding in a few more carbohydrates and I'm still feeling exactly the same. And every other metric about my body feels the same. And so I think that that is the goal is to have more flexibility and and also the other thing I'm doing is really just kind of like minding the season. So over the summer, I was leaning into a little bit more of like the seasonal fruits and, and things like that. And then as we get closer into winter, I might find that like, I don't really want to have carbohydrates right now. I'm not needing them. Like I live in Orlando, Florida. It's really hot here. And so it does cool down a little in the winter. So it's not going to be as hot. I'm not going to feel that like need to like that thirst quenching <laughs> ability of certain fruits and things like that. So just kind of playing with with different things. Yeah. I think it's important that people, you know, not necessarily get stuck in a certain way of eating because they're so brainwashed and to think that they have to do that forever or because it worked for them for a little bit of time that they have to keep on doing it forever. And so I, I do like to have people on that are like, I healed myself this way. And now I've been able to add these things in some people it doesn't work. And so they're like, I can go back. I have a baseline to work with. And some people like you, it's like, okay, you know, I once had this really bad issue with allergies and PCOS and all these things that were just awry with my body I've healed. And now I'm able to play around with a little bit more variety. So people don't feel like, you know, you go keto, you have to stay that way forever or same thing with carnivore. Um, it's not like you have to do it unless you want to, if you want to, that's why I tell people, if you want to do it, do it, you know, yeah. but for you, was it that you were kind of starting to crave like a little variety and you were getting a little more curious that kind of led you to experiment or was there something else going on that led you to start trying to play around with different foods? That's a great question. I haven't really even thought about that, but I guess, um, my wedding was a few days right before the pandemic. It was March 7th. Oh my gosh. <laughs> perfect timing. And then, so after that I was eating strict keto before then. And I was like, Oh, after the wedding, I'm going to, you know, just loosen up a little bit and maybe have a few things because I was, um, you know, trying to really keep things in check for the wedding. And I just started eating some carbs and I, 
I just, I felt good with it. And I just stayed doing that. And I think a lot of it was stress driven um, because of the pandemic, but I didn't feel badly like I did beforehand. I wasn't having these huge spikes and I, you know, I used a CGM for some of the time and I did have some crazy spikes with some things I ate. Like I had an acai bowl and I had it late at night my blood sugar stayed elevated for eight hours. I mean, I was like, okay, you know, like learning that like it's all bio-individual. So we need to, we still need to use those tools and different strategies. I'm not just like, oh, I'm going to eat all the carbs now. Like I don't do that. I'm, I'm specific with it. So the other thing for me was that I had a lot of like sugar cravings Mm -hmm. and I was, like I said, I was like a sweet tooth. I had a sweet tooth. And like, I always say that I have the sugar dragon and he's, I, he hibernates when I do keto, but like, I don't want him to wake back up and be like driving all my decisions being like, you should have, you should get some more chocolate or like, Oh, you can have one piece of that. Or like, Oh, maybe you can go buy this. Like that's the sugar dragon talking. And like, I'm very familiar with when the sugar dragon is driving my decisions. And so that's another thing that I'm careful about as I'm reintroducing carbohydrates that I'm not doing something that's really going to wake up my sugar dragon or make me crave all these foods. I haven't really had that experience. And I, I feel like I've gone from being an abstainer to more of a moderator, which is great because I've healed a lot of things on the inside. Um, but I like that when you were saying that people, and I myself did this when you kind of like identify with your diet because yeah. it made you feel so good. It, it brought so many beneficial changes to your life that you just feel like you owe everything to this diet. So you think that you, it's the perfect thing for you. You need to stick with it. And my advice to you is to just stay open to, to knowing when sticking with your diet is actually erring on the side of being detrimental to you. So like ketosis, I feel like the main goal of ketosis is to develop this metabolic flexibility, to be able to burn fat for fuel. I used it as a healing protocol so I could lower my insulin levels, reverse my PCOS, and to be able to tolerate carbohydrates better. And now I'm able to do that, but not that well. Like I'm just not someone who's going to thrive on a high carbohydrate diet. So now I'm kind of finding what balance works for me. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? I just want to do a full day of carnivore. So go ahead and do it. Like the point is the body doesn't want the exact same inputs 365 days a year. The body does not thrive like that. It can thrive like that for a certain amount of time. So if you're listening to this and you're like, wow, carnivore was working for me, working for me. And then it stopped. Like if it stopped, if a diet stops working for you, you need, I think that there's a few things you need to do. You need to, like I said, look outside of the diet. So look at all those things. You might need to look at your digestion or all those things that nutritional therapists, we look at um, digestion and balance of fats and minerals and potential like toxins or things like that going on, gut pathogens. But you also need to potentially learn to pivot. If you're a Friends fan, you're probably saying pivot in your head. (laughs) Um, You need to pivot and try something else. Like you can stay in the framework. Of course, I recommend staying in the framework of whole real foods, right? So it's kind of like, which branch of this can we bring in? And I made this analogy to you earlier, but a lot of people just get, so if we think of our body like a car and our diet is the gasoline, if something's wrong with our car, we might be like, oh, let me just put in like ultra premium gas. So this is us like changing our diet to this like really nice pasture raised, grass fed carnivore diet, beautiful, right? But the car still has problems, you're not going to change the gas again. You're going to look under the hood. You're going to change the oil. You're going to do something else to it. So it, it could be time to either look under the hood, change something about your lifestyle, or maybe start adding something back in even just cyclically, you know? So for females that might, might look like with your monthly cycle for men that might look like seasonally or, you know, every month or whatever it is. And so you can find some little nuanced, you know, break those stalls and, you know, not be like this diet doesn't work for me or like it stopped working and like 
you know, carnivore harder, that's not always the answer. So, yeah, I agree. And I, you know, working with Judy a little bit uh, myself now, it's like, I'm learning so much about everyone's like carnivore diet's going to heal your gut. Um, it's going to heal this, that, and the other. And the more that I stick around in the space that I'm in, and the more I talk to other people, I see people who have been doing carnivore strictly for two years who have gut issues like SIBO and H. pylori and inflammation off the charts. And they've been super strict for two years. And it's like, you never worked with your gut health. You just kind of put a bandaid on it by being carnivore. And some people can do it. It starves out the bad bacteria, but some people it's just not going to work. And so when we take this, like one size fits all and the diet is going to do everything kind of a mindset, I think it can be very dangerous, you know? Yeah. there are people out there that can do it and do the diet and that's all that they need to do because perhaps they didn't have prior metabolic issues going on they weren't ever pre-diabetic I was pre-diabetic before I did carnivore like there's a lot of things at play that like you're saying with the antibiotics and all the allergies I mean I was on antibiotics I feel like we were like the same person growing up I had eczema chronic ear infections and strep throat and it was like antibiotics constantly yeah and it was horrible. And so you think about what that does to your gut and, and I have lingering gut issues from all those antibiotics, you know, yeah. I'm just never going to be that person. Maybe I will be, but like with this, like robust, you know, thriving gut bacteria, I'm working on it, but it takes yeah. a long time. It does. It takes patience and time and it's not just diet alone. It's your whole entire lifestyle. You probably need some gut support, which is why an NTP, someone like yourself would know how to tell someone what kind of probiotics would work best for them, when to take them, how to take them. It's not just as simple as going and buying some off the shelf. Like it's, it, it takes work and time and a lot of patience. Yeah. I actually have a small digestion, uh, a course coming out because I recorded it for my group coaching clients. I'm like, people need to know this information because they think just go buy a probiotic, but that's just addressing the large intestine. Yeah. Digestion is a North to South process, which I'm sure Judy so <laughs> told you. And, you know, it starts in the brain. If we're not in this rest and digest parasympathetic state, we're stopping saliva production, which has salivary amylases. These, they are digestive enzymes that help break down starch. I notoriously don't chew my food enough. So I'm not mixing the mm -hmm. saliva with the with the amylases to start breaking down the starch in the mouth. So then it leaves it undigested. When it gets in the small intestine, it will rot. Then I didn't have enough stomach acid. That's enough, something that no, most of us don't have. Yeah. And especially if you're carnivore and you need to digest all this protein and this meat and this fat, you absolutely have to have optimal stomach acid production and, you know, learning, working with an NTP to tell you how to supplement with the stomach acid is really important yes. and all the chains of digestion. And then comes the probiotics. So there's so much work. There's a lot of free things we can do to improve how we digest. But at the end of the day, this is where a lot of that targeted supplementation can really, really help to help the body be able to do its job better and then learn how to do it on its own. So a lot of times there's, you know, People are like, oh, I, but I don't want to be on these supplements. There are really great ones that can help you digest, get, extract more nutrients out of the food, calm the, like the small intestine. So the small intestine can absorb the food better. And then your body can start doing it on its own. And you also need to in, input those lifestyle practices as well, like calming your body down, chewing your food, things like that. So there's a yeah. lot that goes into it. Yeah. And Not you know, straight answer of like, just yeah. do this. And like, people will say, I'm eating this much protein and this much fat. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not it, enough information. I don't know how you're sleeping. I don't know. Yeah. It, like, it's like taking your car to the mechanic and being like, I'm putting 89 ultra gas in it. The right, mechanic does not said. know what's going on. <laughs> like, it's just one thing, you right. know? Exactly. It's just one thing. Exactly. We have to look at the whole picture. Yeah. Well, this has been really, really awesome. Um, I know people that are watching this are going to want to know how to find you, how to get in touch with you. So what is the best way to do that? Sure. So I have a podcast called Unlock the Sugar Shackles, and it goes well beyond sugar. And we talk a lot about this 
you know, holistic approach to healing and deep healing. And we, I also am very active on Instagram under Danielle Hamilton health. So those would be the best ways you could find me. Awesome. Cool. And I'll make sure to link all that stuff below. So people know how to follow you, get in touch with you and all that good stuff. But thank you, Danny, so much for coming on and talking with me today. I really appreciate the conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. It was great.